Let's turn this evening to the gospel according to Luke <clears throat> chapter 1. <coughs> the beginning of Luke chapter 1 is dealt with the wonderful conception of a child, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, of aged and righteous Zacharias and Elizabeth. <clears throat> now we consider the events following that, and especially the visit of the angel Gabriel to Mary. <clears throat> want to consider, we'll read tonight <clears throat> verses 26 through 45. Just for time's sake, we won't read the Magnificat, which follows the soul's song of Mary afterwards. Just 26 through and verse 45, hear the word of the Lord, Luke chapter 1. Now in the sixth month, that would be the sixth month of Elizabeth's uh, pregnancy with John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, that would be John the Baptist, leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And then what follows is Mary's wonderful song, uh, praising the Lord. Tonight, we want to consider two words, two phrases, and they are the same phrases of verses 28 and 42. Uh, first of all, uh, the Ga angel Gabriel's uh, word that Mary, who is to rejoice, as she's highly favored, and the Lord is with her, is to do this because she is blessed among women. Blessed are you among women, the angel says. Verse 42, Cousin Elizabeth says the same thing. She speaks out in a loud voice upon the greeting of Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But those two phrases, blessed among, are you among women, are the phrases on which we would focus this evening in a sermon. This is, in fact, what I want to be the beginning of four Advent sermons uh, on the Annunciation, the announcement of the birth of Jesus and the manner of the birth of Jesus to Mary. I want to consider uh, a, a few things around that announcement and then the song of Mary called the Magnificat itself. 
as we would go through these wonderful uh, events in the scripture and all of these things that are for our edification. The testimony of Gabriel, the angel, and Elizabeth, Mary's aged cousin, is that Mary is blessed among women. Blessed are you, the angel says, among women. Blessed are you, Elizabeth says, among women. Both of these servants of God, Gabriel and Elizabeth, are calling in this phrase, blessed are you among women, they're calling Mary the most blessed of all women. That's what they're meaning. She is most blessed in a particular way to be the bearer of the Lord and the Savior, to be the one in whose wombs, uh, in whose womb Jesus himself would be fashioned and there would be this wonderful incarnation and birth of the Savior in and through her. And so the reasons that she is the blessed of all women in this unique situation are given and they're twofold. First of all, the nature of the Son. He is called by the angel, the great Son, the great one who will be called great. He's called the Son of the Highest in verse 32, and he is as well the Messiah. In verses 32 and 33, he's the great one and the Son of the Highest, who is given by the Lord God the throne of his father David. That's a messianic fulfillment here that's being Reveal. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So this one, who is born in the womb of Mary, will be the Son of God. He is the Son of God, and he is the Savior as well. Elizabeth joins in the accolades that are given to this son, this wonderful, blessed one of the womb of Mary, when she says, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me, verse 43, speaking there of Jesus in his mediatorial capacity as the Lord of salvation. So the nature of the Son is the reason why Mary is called blessed among women in the most blessed situation as well. Besides that, the manner in which the Son would be born is unique. There will be a conception in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit of God. This will be this wonderful birth of the Virgin, therefore, so that the Messiah will not have any spot of the original sin of Adam. He will be the perfect man, Savior, who is the God, who is revealed in the flesh in this way, in this holy way. And so these things make Mary to be the greatest among all women, or the most blessed, I should say, among all women. And this announcement is indeed, therefore, the great birth announcement of the greatest birth ever. The narration, um, ironically, focuses, however, on the two parents. Elizabeth is given the, <clears throat> a prior visit and by the angel, and she herself has been visited and blessed in a unique way. She's blessed so that she's miraculously with child in her old age and in her barrenness. She was barren, not able to have children, and she and Zacharias now will be <coughs> blessed with the son who will be the forerunner. He also will be called great as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. She visits, or Mary visits, Elizabeth, this younger, uh, this younger cousin by far, probably a teenager, and <clears throat> she is the one, however, who would be this one, and the focus is on her because she will be of child or with child without any earthly conception whatsoever, without any man, without any husband, without any paramour, to be the father of the child, she will be with child of God, the Holy Spirit. This is the wonder of wonders prophesied in the book of Isaiah, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. So this attention given on these women, these lowly women, is ironically front and center here in this narrative, but 
we should not be deluded and distracted. The reason why <clears throat> there's this attention on these lowly women and their visits from on high is so that we might be turned to God, whether that's Mary herself responding in praise in the Magnificat, her soul magnifying the Lord and rejoicing in God her Savior, or in any other way, these miraculous conceptions, and especially the one in Mary's womb, is to point us to the praise of God. This is indeed for our salvation, that we might be blessed of all people, and for our glorious beginning of the praise to God in heaven. Isaiah chapter 9 is really being fulfilled here. We need to remember that. As the prophet long ago said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish, order and establish it with justice and judgment from this time forward, even forever. So we consider <clears throat> blessed among women, this Mary, this little Mary, who now becomes blessed among women. And we want to consider that she's blessed indeed. <clears throat> Secondly, that she's blessed among women. And what I'm going to point out there is she's not blessed to be above women. She's blessed among women. And then finally, that she is blessed and that this son is conceived and born in this way. And as this son, that we might, all of us, men and women, praise God. What a wonderful passage indeed. The word directing us to the Savior and to praise him now and forever. So Mary, blessed indeed, most blessed indeed of all women, and she's blessed in the first uh, place because the son <clears throat> that she gives um, is conceived in her womb and she will give birth to is her Savior. In verse 47 of the Magnificat, the praise of Mary, we even read that her spirit has rejoiced in God, her Savior. This little one born in Mary, or born of Mary, will save Mary. That's what we must remember here is a unique aspect, a, a very important aspect of her being blessed. To be blessed is to be spoken well of by God. And she's spoken well of, not in herself, but because she's been chosen by God to be saved by the Son of God, the Messiah. In every sense of the word, Mary, like all of us, needs to be saved, as we'll point out presently. But she will be saved, and she'll be response to this salvation with the appropriate fruit of the Holy Spirit, who is the one who conceived Jesus in her womb. She will be saved by his life and by his death. He will be crucified for her. Uh, Mary needs atonement of sins, and so Jesus will atone for her sins. Jesus will rise for the justification of many, including Mary. Jesus will be in heaven and ever interceding for the saints, including Mary, who is and continues a sinner. As well, <clears throat> in a unique way, <clears throat> Mary will be taught by her son. It's striking how she's taught when, for example, she's rebuked by her son in, when the son turns 12 years old and he's found in the temple answering and asking hard questions of the leaders of the Jews. At that time, Mary, in consternation over her son, you can imagine, he was lost from her presence for three days. She comes and, and she's upset. And Jesus says to her, Wist you not, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And, of course, she who pondered the birth of her son and to witness the, the worship of the Magi should have understood what Jesus was all about. She'd be taught by him and even rebuked by him. I find even a gentle rebuke of Mary in John chapter 2 when Jesus performs his first miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. And when at that time Mary wants Jesus to perform a miracle, apparently, 
uh, Jesus rebukes her and says it's, it's not the time in so many words. And, and then Mary, learning of Jesus, says, now you do whatever he tells you to do. You do whatever he tells you to do. And so she's learning from this son, and uh, she's being saved and sanctified in this way as well. We want to understand, however, that the greatest blessing that Mary has that singles her out of all the blessed and saved ones is that she bears, she bears the Son of God and her Lord in her womb. No one else did that. No one else was chosen to be the, the bearer of the Son of God and the Lord in the womb. And she would bring him forth then also to raise him. Just a few comments about this. The wonder of the holy conception will be such that there will be no earthly father's DNA transmitted to, to, Mary, to, or to the son through Mary. There will be, however, the Holy Spirit's conception and the word <coughs> overshadowed how delicate is the Holy Spirit or in inspiring this, this narrative of the incarnation and the holy conception, how delicate, I say, is the Holy Spirit in not using words like mating. The Holy Spirit didn't mate with Mary, but the Holy Spirit somehow overshadowed Mary. And that word there is used for the transfiguration of Jesus when the glory of God was seen on the mount. And it seems to be that at this time, there's a description of glory that's descending from heaven through the Holy Spirit conception in the womb of Mary so that there is this indwelling of the Son of God in this new temple, this new place where Shekinah glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, would reside. Remarkable way in which the Holy Spirit conception is described here. Overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the highest is what explains, for loss of other words, we would say, this miraculous conception of the Son of God in the womb. Holy Spirit conception, so no original sin. No being born in Adam for Jesus Christ. He is born in God. He is in this womb in the fellowship of God. He is ever holy. He is ever pure. No original sin. No actual sin. Never could sin, even though he could be tempted. He is one, therefore, who is suitable to be the Holy Savior, as well, he is fully man. He will develop in Mary's womb like other human beings do. It will be nine months gestation, as we call it, and development. He is the one from conception of birth who's fully human. In fact, I say to the abortionists, the holy conception of Jesus, the man in the womb of Mary, proves that from conception, the human being is a human being after all and not an animal and not simply waiting to be human after a certain amount of time. Holy conception by Jesus or by the Holy Spirit of Jesus, this one who is fully man and yet retains the divine nature, the divine person. He is the Son of God incarnate. Then <clears throat> there would be, after this development, in the normal human way, there would be the raising by the covenant mother of him. The nurture that is given hers to be the responsibility of the nurture, mind you, of Jesus, the word of God, in the truths of God's word. To her came, as well as every other Jewish mother, the calling of Deuteronomy 6, uh, that the covenant home would be a place of nurture, where there would be the words of the prophets and of the law would be uh, taught to the children, and this was their obligation that they might know the fear of God. Amazing 
Mary, the mother, would be called to care for Jesus in the earthly way, feeding him at her breast, and also in the covenantal way, teaching him uh, the things of the Word of God. Hard to imagine how one could be in such a position. Hard to imagine how anyone could be in that situation and not feel completely intimidated and saying, I'm not up for the task and therefore I won't do it. But Mary was qualified by God and grace to do these things, to be sure. Well, this is her most blessedness. She's saved by this one in her womb who is the complete and perfect Savior. And then she bears this Savior and would bring him up in the fear and admonition of God. Isn't that amazing? And it's all blessing. This is what is told by angel Gabriel and also by Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women. The angel adds, rejoice highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now the word blessed there is the word that's usually uh, used for to describe the blessings of God. And literally it's being well spoken of. It's being favored by word from heaven. And certainly the word from heaven, Jesus himself, the word made flesh, is being blessed by God through Mary's being blessed and the Lord being with her. This good word was spoken to Mary. It will be, therefore, God himself who blesses her. That's on the forefront here. That's why <coughs> Gabriel must say to her, with God, nothing will be impossible, verse 37. Mary's troubled. She can hardly believe it. The angel Gabriel would confirm her faith by saying, there's already been a miracle in your older cousin Elizabeth, but now you ought to know, therefore, that that thing that I announce with you is also possible because with God nothing is impossible. And so you have this affirmation of the word here. There is a one-way communication of grace here. No one is earning anything here. Mary herself as well. She's not blessed and most blessed to earn something. She's blessed simply because she is in the good favor of God according to his ordination, that one among all women who would be the bearer of the Son of God in the womb. There's no cooperation that's being emphasized here, as some would say, as something necessary for this thing to happen. Rather, there is this complete sovereign grace movement of God, of a thing impossible, this overwhelming word, this good word of an angel, and also of Elizabeth, who is a godly uh, cousin indeed of Mary. And so you have this uh, understanding here that Mary is grateful. And that's why the song at the end, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me Blessed, favored one. And that leads to my second point. <clears throat> I want to underscore what both words from the Gabriel, angel Gabriel and Elizabeth do underscore. Blessed is Mary among women. She's blessed not so that she's taken to be above women and so therefore made different than ordinary women, she's blessed among women as a woman. And that would mean that she's blessed undeserving of any blessing. She is, in other words, a sinful woman, just as are all women and all men. Born in Adam, she has original sin. She shows her sin in the raising of her child. I'm sure she lost her temper, perhaps, confounded by the perfectness of that son. Again, can you imagine it? And like any one of us, she was not sin-free at all. So from her conception and her development in, her, in, in the womb of her mother, 
to the tomb, she would be in need of this Savior whose salvation she rejoices in. She is of Adam, and in Adam there's neither bond nor free, Jew or Gentile, male or female. All are in Adam. Let's use that as an interpretation of that verse in Galatians chapter 3. In Adam, all are the same, sinful in need of a Savior. Besides that, she's a lowly female. She is of the weaker sex. She was first in the transgression, as Eve was, as representative of, of one of the race of Eve. But I want to speak this to this as well. She's among Jewish women. Mary is, and she's part of a Jewish race. She's of the house of David. But at this point in the history of Judaism, there is a casting away of God. The ax is laid to the root of the tree of Judaism. So when Jesus comes, this is what occurs, judgment upon the, four, uh, the erstwhile house of God and upon the people that call themselves the people of God. And she is among her, that race as one corporately guilty of rejecting God's covenant, not wanting God to be with them, at least in the way that he had described in the spiritual way of being with them as the forgiver of their sins. And though she's of a David's line, apparently there is no male, for all we know, from Solomon, in whose line there would be this promised king um, from David's loins. <clears throat> Joseph is of David through another son, Nathan. You look at the genealogies in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3. But then there is Mary, however, and she is of the line of David through Solomon. The problem, however, is that God had already pronounced a curse upon that race through Solomon. If you read it, Jeremiah 22, this is where the curse is pronounced, so that there could not be a male child upon the throne of David in the ordinary way. The curse is pronounced upon one Coniah or Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, for his iniquities. Jeremiah 22 and verse 28. Is this man Coniah despised and broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Pronouncement of a curse. Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as childless. That is, he will be without a male apparent to the throne. There will be no more royalty in the house of David forever. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Mary represents the people of God at the end of the line. The people of God in desperate straits indeed. For the promises had come to them, but Mary is the one you see in whom God would reveal that these promises will be fulfilled in no ordinary way. It will be fulfilled in this Holy Spirit conception of one who will indeed be on the throne of David but who will be not only a son of David, but the son of God. And so you have this hopeless situation. Mary is in need, in need of the Savior and of blessing. She's among women here. She is uniquely blessed, though not raised above women or men. Now here, for a few minutes... I do want to take on the Roman Catholic position that basically makes Mary to be above women, uniquely above them, and even like unto the Savior whom she will bear. I say the Roman Catholic Church does this not on the basis of Scripture, but on the basis of their own traditions and their departure from the Scripture. It's striking <clears throat> that the emergent church in our day is known for recasting the terms 
of the scripture and of the creeds in modern language and evacuating the terms and the doctrines of any traditional and biblical meaning. Well, the Roman Catholic Church is not the emergent church, but it is the divergent church of long ago. Could better be called the Reformed Divergent Church, the R, or not the Reformed, the Roman Divergent Church, the RDC, than the RCC. This is because they've elevated tradition above the Word of God. So, for example, and I say this, beloved, and we'll come round here to ourselves being humble because we need to know that God himself rebukes us all here for giving any praise to anybody but himself. But I want to speak to this because this is a great power in our age, Roman Catholicism and traditionalism and all the smells and the bells. Over one billion strong is the Roman Catholic state church and growing for all we know. But here's how, in certain ways, their Mariology, their dogma of Mary is perpetuated. And first of all, it's by claiming that Mary is the mother of God. Mary is called the mother of God based on Luke 1.43, where Elizabeth says that she is blessed as the mother of my Lord. And she was wondering why the mother of my Lord should come to me. Well, the Council of Ephesus in A.D. 431, I believe, coined the phrase that Mary was the mother of God. And the Greek phrase is theotokos, uh, God-bearer. And it's derived from this announcement to Mary that she would be the mother of my Lord. Well, the problem is, <clears throat> first of all, the Bible doesn't teach that Mary is the mother of God, teaches that she is the mother of the Christ, and that is the word here that's used for Christ. He's the Lord. Just about every place in the Bible, in the New Testament, when Lord is used of Jesus, it's referring to his exalted uh, uh, mediatorial ship as the Son of God incarnate, but not as him who is divine, as the eternal Son of God. And secondly, <clears throat> The problem with this is doctrinal. The, if Mary is the mother of God, there's a certain preeminence of Mary given to God, him, uh, to God himself. For after all, to be the mother of God is to have a maturity that God doesn't have. It's to have a responsibility that you need to take care for God and so on. And this is leading to all kinds of problems as we shall see. Some have said a better explanation of Mary's situation in relation to Jesus is she's the Christotokos. That's an alternative phrase. She's the bearer of Christ. And of that we can be agreed because the Bible teaches that here. But to say that she's the mother of God is to mix um, without, with compromise the divine natures with the human natures and it's to elevate Mary beyond her status. She is simply a bearer of the Christ in the human nature. That's as far as we can go. But then <clears throat> there's another twisting of the scriptures, and this is fatal. When it is said <clears throat> by the angel Gabriel in verse 28 that Mary is to rejoice because she's highly favored, that's my translation. Other translations, and rightly or wrongly, but closely, say she's full of grace. Hail Mary. That's how it goes in Roman Catholic, Catholic uh, verbiage. Hail Mary, full of grace and truth. She's full of grace. Here's what they do with that. They say that Mary is sinless. This is their doctrine. Uh, this is not my words. It's certainly not slander. I am being fair. Mary is sinless. And she's sinless because she's full of grace. And this is perfect tense, they say, and therefore she has been full of grace up to now, and she has been full of grace when? Since her own holy conception. Meaning, she was immaculately conceived. Somehow, not in the same way as the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus without a man, but full, uh, through a natural birth and conception of man and woman, she somehow escaped escaped the dirt, the guilt, and the pollution that was in Adam. She was never really born a true woman in Adam. 
She was always in this state and condition of holiness without guilt, and therefore she never sinned. This is the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary, who's called Panagia, All Holy One, in honor of Mary, and even next to Jesus, who's called that Holy One who is to be born of her womb. And so you see what Roman Catholicism is doing here. They are elevating Mary to a status above ordinary sinful women who need to be saved, and even uh, giving her rights and uh, privileges and conditions that are only suitable to be said of Jesus Christ himself. It's striking that when the Protestants point out that Mary herself says that she rejoices in God my Savior, verse 47, they say, well, she was saved from having to be saved. That's what they'll say. Even though the Bible there speaks of God my Savior in the ordinary term, again, they're twisting terms of the Bible to shape, uh, to be filled with meaning according to their own preconceived notions. This is a terrible problem. If Mary needs not a savior in the normal sense of the word, she's not at all a normal human being. But the fact is, and children, let's always remember this. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is not one Mary or Harry or Ken or Sally or anybody who's righteous, no, not one who's born of man, except Jesus, of course, the righteous one. They refuse, do the Roman Catholics, to have Mary in this unrighteous, um, <clears throat> um, as, as an unrighteous one in whom Adam, uh, who are all born in Adam and who all die. Striking that there is some question as to whether Mary even did die, because it's also Roman Catholic, according to them, infallible doctrine, that Mary was assumed into heaven. Whether she died or not is debatable. Actually, most do believe that she died. However, she is now resurrected. She is like none other, except, I suppose, Elijah and Enoch, with body and soul in heaven as part of her glory. She was assumed into heaven. And there, strikingly, she is called the co-redemptress. Mary is elevated above all women and even to be on a par with the Savior as the female one of heaven. Jesus is the king of heaven. He's the king on the throne of David. And she's the queen of heaven. She's the advocate besides Jesus. She's the one through whom devotion to God is richly furnished as we come to her with our needs and our cares. Mary is. She's the gentle one. She's the woman. Besides that, she has, according to the Roman Catholic statements themselves, she has a part in the salvation of Jesus and ever since the conception. She was an integral part in this conception so that without her say and her submission and her fiat, as they call it, let it be as with your handmaid, this would not have occurred. God waited on Mary for there to be this permission, as it were, granted to him so that this could all occur. And so the devotion and humility of Mary is elevated above anything that is either reasonable or biblical. She is, as well, the one who has a part in the sufferings of Christ, as one who was by Jesus at the cross. Remember, she was one of the few by Jesus participating as no one else could besides her son in those sufferings for a lost humanity. In heaven as well, she is, as I said, another advocate right beside Jesus and who is important to know because we can find great comfort in this sure path to a deep relationship to God. How to name just a few other things it's Mary, of all the pantheon of saints to whom we can pray to, who was a great treasury of merit. Oh, a tremendous treasury of merit. You can pray to Mary and she can bestow upon you all kinds of gifts and forgiveness itself because she is so meritorious and so compassionate and perhaps even unlike Jesus, more compassionate than he is. Oh, of this. 
the Roman Catholic Church say, is not to take away from the devotion and worship we should have of Jesus. But what they're saying is taken away from what they have said in all of their doctrines. And they've made more than a mountain after Mary, uh, 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 out of Mary. They made her this mediatrix, this co-redemptress, and who is given honor and praise in a way that is, frankly and bluntly, blasphemy. The whole narrative here of this Mary and her place in, salvation, in the salvation narrative is to draw the attention not to Mary, but to the one in her womb. As the prophet Isaiah would say, the one who announced that there would be this son who was born, in verses 20 through 22, assemble yourselves together, he says, and come and draw near together. You have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Am not I the Lord, and there is no other God besides me? A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me? Look to me, God says, and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. So the narrative of this uniquely blessed among women is for all the ends of the earth to worship God our Savior and not Mary. And this is my final point, beloved. We need to hear this, and even of the error of a whole apostate church. We ourselves might not be proud, for Christmas is all about our need, our need, and God meeting it. It's about the unspeakable gift is Christmas, the incarnation, the Holy Spirit conception. It's about the praise that we ought to be giving. It's striking. <clears throat> we learn, <clears throat> and the Roman Catholics would that they would learn, even at this latter day, we learn <clears throat> that there was a, a Roman Catholic before there were ever Roman Catholics and a denomination full of them. Jesus notes the, this Roman Catholic. It was a certain woman, Luke chapter 11 and verse 27. It happened as he spoke these things. He was speaking of wonderful um, parables and working miracles. She spoke these things, a certain woman, and I say she's the first Roman Catholic, a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. That's what she says, blessed. And all attention then was on Mary. But Jesus said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He would say a similar thing in Luke 8 and verses 19 through 21. His mother and his brothers came to him, Mary and his brothers. That is, Jesus had other siblings, brothers and sisters. One of the Roman Catholic errors is that there was a perpetual virginity of Mary to keep her pure. They think sex is a bad thing. So that she never had any brothers or sisters. Uh, she would only have Jesus. This is a lie. There are other words to use for cousins. These are brothers and sisters, and there's no need for our thinking that the Bible would have to have this perpetual virginity of Mary. So Mary and her, and her other sons came to Jesus and could not approach him because of the crowd, and it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Talk about demeaning. Mary and the brothers of Jesus are put on a par with brothers and sisters in Christ everywhere. Hallelujah, people of God. God, he comes and he comes and he will get the praise in Jesus Christ alone and 
Mary herself urges us to do the same thing. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And when she ponders in her heart the things that occurred when the Magi came from afar and they worshipped this king, they worshipped him, we are led also to ponder these things in our heart. Not Mary, but the thing that was done to her, so blessed among women, so blessed that we might be blessed, all saved together to praise God forever. So I urge you, beloved, in this time of Advent, be thinking about approaching God in a more praise, praising way, leaving the world, rejoicing in God our Savior, in that wonderful Lord of glory who's born in a virgin's womb, conceived there and then born from there. Think of that, how God has provided and how he provides for you and I today and every day that we might go our way with the Christian gospel of the praiseworthiness of God with us, this great mystery of godliness, God with us in Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us focused on you and not on a woman or on a man, not on anyone but you, so that, Lord, we might in a decrease and you might increase and we might acknowledge you in greater ways as the God of our salvation. We ask, Lord, that you would bless and sanctify the preaching to our own hearts and I come away warned against Mariolatry and also warned against dismissing her as just, just another woman, for surely she was singularly blessed. And we praise you for that, because in her singular blessedness as the mother of our Lord, you have blessed us all, and you would be exalted by a whole body of believers. Lord, may we be in the word of God, May we be so led that we are pondering anew what the Almighty has done and can do. Amen.